اللهم اجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون احسنه The last time we tried as much as possible to cover um, the area in history uh, which is called uh, the beginning of Tashayya. And um, let me say this before I begin. I know, you know, because some of us have grown up uh, believing certain things and um, we never very much questioned uh, the things that we believe, at least to the extent of not feeling um, uh, incensed sometimes by some statements that we never heard before. So um, uh, you, you have to give yourself uh, a breather in, uh, or you have to condition, well you have to think before coming here that you're going to hear some things you haven't heard before. And um, just uh, grow accustomed to that and makes things easier for everyone. Now uh, this time around, we're going to try to take a look at um, uh, a portion of our history uh, in which a trend or a current uh, of Muslims uh, emerged. Uh, these, this current or this trend within the Muslim Ummah at that time is referred to historically uh, by historians or by fuqaha or by scholars as al-khawarij. Now what makes this a little easier than the last session and easier than the coming session is that we don't have anyone here who, who thinks of themselves as a khariji, as one of the khawarij. So when you don't think about yourself belonging to this group of Muslims, you're more relaxed, unlike when you define yourself as being, let's say, a Shiai, as that has become... Uh, known throughout time until you inherited its meaning with all that goes with it today and unlike those who uh, think of themselves as Sunnis likewise they inherited that all that went with it in the passage of time and thus right now have that particular definition in mind so here we're dealing with a um, segment of Muslims that is neither quote-unquote Sunni nor quote-unquote Shi'i. So I, I hope this is going to go a little easier uh, than the last time and a little easier than the coming one next month. Now, the, the word Khawarij means... Uh, in a sense, dissidents, and it also means um, insurgents, and it also could mean um, in one of the sense of the words rebels. So if you can you know, mesh these together, you get a sense of what al-Khawarij means. types of Muslims. Okay, we're going to have to reconstruct the uh, a little, not in any uh, in-depth details, but we're going to have to reconstruct the, uh, the dynamics that gave rise to these types of Muslims. Uh, we can recall in our uh, Islamic history courses, I hope, the Battle of Safin. The Battle of Safin is where there were two sides, two Muslim sides that uh, were locked in battle against each other. Uh, usually when you read Islamic books, 
Islamic history books, they will tell you one side is the side of Imam Ali, and the other side is the side of Muawiyah. Now, obviously to a certain extent that is correct. But I think if we think about it a little more, we will realize that we cannot simplify it as a conflict between two personalities, and certainly it was. But it's much more than that because it's a conflict between two um, political uh, and social and economic trends in society. There are some people who consider themselves uh, nationalist first, or who consider themselves status individuals in society first, or who consider themselves um, uh, power-centered first. And those who are free of the considerations of status, power, and, um, and uh, a type of nationalism that may uh, define a particular group of people. So these were the trends that were locked at Safin. Of course, one trend was led by Imam Ali, the other trend was led by Muawiyah. But the fault that we have in re looking at this history is that we look at it as a, as a matter of personalities clashing with each other, which as I said is correct, but we don't extend our view to realize that beyond being a clash of personalities, it's also a clash of trends, or a clash of ideologies, or a clash of economic interests. Unfortunately, we, we don't do that. This is one area that we have to work on. So at Safin, when we had these two figures, and we had with them an assembly of people, uh, what, was, what happened in the course of that battle was, the battle was turning against Muawiyah. And the troops that were with him. They were beginning to be defeated. As they sensed that this is the beginning of their defeat, they came up with a ploy, or if you want a, a more uh, uh, used word, they came up with a trick. Uh, so they said, let's raise these masahif, the, the Qur'an on, on paper, the Qur'an that's committed, uh, and it's, uh, committed in writing, committed to writing. Let's raise these masahif and call for an arbitration to uh, the differences right now that have brought us to this war. And uh, as I said, we're skipping a lot of the details here that are involved in this because we want to we want to we want to have a sense of how these khawarij came into being. Up until now, there was no um, there was no solidification of a trend that became known as al khawarij uh, from here on. Uh, so when the camp and the army and the side of Muawiyah uh, felt that there's an imminent defeat that is pending, they're being routed now, they, uh, on the advice of the second guy in Muawiyah's uh, camp, Amr ibn al-As, uh, some people say, look, you refer to Amr ibn as guy. Well, uh, you can refer to him whatever you want, however you want, but um, in, in this, at this particular moment, and in the, um, 
in the scheming that is developing uh, is probably the, the, the appropriate word to use. We're not looking at him before. We're not looking at you know some other things that have been going on in his life. We're looking at this moment. And so um, what happened as a result of that um, begs our attention because uh, this is where there's going to be a very serious division in the side and in the uh, army of Imam Ali. What happened at that moment, even though Imam Ali wanted to press on with the military solution to this opposing side, what developed at that moment when the, uh, the soldiers on Imam Ali's side saw these masahif being raised and said, what's all this about? They said, well, we want to we want to um, solve our differences on the basis, we want to arbitrate our differences with reference to the Qur'an. This is the Qur'an, this is how we want to arbitrate these differences. This caused a split in the camp of Imam Ali, and for the Imam to ascertain the nature of this split, Remember, this was not a matter of uh, weeks or months to try to figure out who's who in this, but a, uh, a quick assessment of how uh, the people inside Imam Ali's uh, armed forces felt about this. It uh, appeared, and um, as far as we know, uh, this is quite accurate, uh, that most of the people who were fighting against Muawiyah and the opposite side, they wanted to accept this arbitration. Uh, if we take a moment, and many people don't take a moment just to stop here and give it a thought, but if we take a moment to think, uh, why did an Imam Ali agree with uh, the majority opinion of people on his side. The historians that I come across don't make it clear uh, in a uh, convincing sense why he agreed to this. It happened, wh whichever angle in history you're looking at, this is what happened. Imam Ali wanted to finish off the enemy uh, opponents and most of the people with him did not want to do that. So when he realized that is going to be the case, he accepted the, um, the idea of arbitration. It was more or less in these circumstances imposed on him. For some of us who haven't thought um, deeply into this issue, uh, the question could be, well, it's not binding on an imam to uh, uh, resonate with the majority opinion of the people that he represents. For those who have this trend of thinking, answer the question why an Imam Ali resonated with the majority of people that were with him. Okay. Now, those people now who thought that this is not right, we should keep on uh, putting the military pressure on the enemy until finally he is defeated, this opinion did not um, acquiesce to the majority opinion that is around, the people who wanted this arbitration, and then the agreement of the Imam to this arbitration. We know it, it, from all that we know, it was a reluctant agreement. It was an agreement against his uh, better judgment. It was an agreement that um, conflicted 
with the immediate course developing on the battlefield. So uh, this is this is where I want to tell you these khawarij that are later on go, are, are going to appear and have an impact on Islamic history, especially at that time. Because if we look at them now, they sort of uh, uh, there's not many of them around. Let's say, and just maybe if we want to um, inflate their numbers, maybe we can say there's four or five million. No one knows for sure. There's no uh, surveys among Muslims who, that really uh, bring these uh, numbers into focus. But an educated guess would, would put the number at that, at that level. But at that time, this was the, what you can say the first political moment or the first ideological moment of the Khawarij. Now, what happened after this also contributes to the way they began their thinking process. What happened after that was, and, and remember these people are inside the climate of an Imam Ali. They're not uh, on the other side and they are not indifferent, meaning they're not there just watching this. They're inside uh, the, uh, the military and political efforts of Imam Ali. What happened after that was what's called um, the choice of the muhakkim. They, when they agree to the principle of tahkim, now, okay, who's going to represent this side, who's going to represent that side? And when it comes to the side of Imam Ali, there is... Um, enough information that indicates that Imam Ali's choice to represent his side at the talks that are planned for the future would be Abdullah ibn Abbas. And, uh, but the other body of people in their swelling numbers, they said, no, we, we don't agree to that. We want Abu Musa al-Ash'ari to represent our, represent our side. So here is where, in the, the minds of these types of people, they thought, uh, at, at, at the moment, at that um, military moment, uh, there may have been reservations, there may have been th second thoughts, there may have been, wait a minute, this is not going right, the notions. These were not firm ideas at the time. These were just... Um, impressions and notions. So they saw Imam Ali on one hand accepting an arbitration that he really didn't want to accept and then on the other hand accepting an arbiter who he really didn't want to accept. And the, once again the same question is presented here. If we are speaking about uh, an imam who is uh, unattached to the sentiments and the uh, um, expectations of the people that are on his side, he could have simply made uh, a singular opinion concerning these two issues, the arbitration and the person who is going to represent him at that arbitration. So I, don't, I disagree with all of this. But that's not the way it went. And for the purposes of looking at uh, the genesis of these khawarij, we can trace them to these internal dynamics. This is where they said, um, this is, this, this because, at first they didn't express it in these words. But later on they're going to say, these are... Um, uh, this is uh, high crimes and misdemeanors. This is treason to the Muslims. These are crimes of the highest magnitude. But at that time, um, most of these people who later on were going to become these khawarij, 
before they hardened their positions later on, they were they were on the side of those who wanted arbitration. So at that moment in the defining war between Al Imam Ali and Muawiyah, at that moment, uh, the the ones who were going to become Khawarij were to be found here and there. They were on both sides. Meaning, some of them wanted the war to go ahead, and some of them wanted the war to stop. So. When they came to Imam Ali later on uh, and told him that we think what was done was wrong, that it, none of this should have happened, those who were uh, of the opinion that it should have happened said, we made a big mistake. We shouldn't have agreed when we did agree to this arbitration. And when we agreed to it, we in fact were kafirs. Remember right now the word kafir is bounced around a lot. And by some people it's a, it's a very easy word to use against other Muslims. Well, here is probably the first uh, incident in history where we find this fast and loose with the word kafir. This is when the accusation and the uh, 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 innuendo of kufr uh, gained uh, circulation among this, these types of individuals. So they came to Imam Ali and they said to him, um, we were wrong and at that moment of being wrong we were kafirs and we made up for our mistakes uh, by um, making a sincere tawbah, repentance to Allah, and we ask you to do the same. So what they were doing right here, they were saying that Imam Ali is a kafir. And they were asking him to make tawbah just like they made tawbah so that he's no longer considered a kafir. Um, their slogan was coming out of uh, these types of um, very delicate uh, and very challenging times. Their slogan was, seeing what happened in Safin, uh, they said, لا حكم إلا لله. This was like, they were known, like the people who were always repeating the statement, لا حكم إلا لله. There is no uh, rule except that uh, of Allah's. So that you can't say that you are a ruler or you are a person who administers the law it is Allah not you we have we as human beings have no uh, function when it comes to ruling now of course this uh, uh, sounds ridiculous if there's going to be laws in the land there has to be people who are responsible for maintaining these laws in the land. Laws by themselves just don't exist by themselves. There has to be uh, what today we call law enforcers. Uh, I think if we wait, uh, unless it's very, very, uh, you're, you're, you're going to forget it or it's too technical or something like that. If, if you can mark it down and keep it until the end, that would... That'd yeah, that would be preferable. Yeah. So, um, uh, this, uh, uh, um, these words, لا حكم إلا لله, uh, describe their position on this whole matter. They said, Ali ibn Abi Talib, or Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, or Amr ibn al-As, or Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, they have they have no say into these affairs. 
It is Allah who has pronounced his, his judgment on these affairs and on all other affairs. Uh, and uh, uh, let me remind you that um, in the in the time be, between uh, Safin and the day Al Imam Ali passed away, uh, they displayed an attitude of confrontation with Al Imam Ali. Um, they would, um, if he would be giving a khutbah in the masjid, they would stand up and interrupt him. Um, they would say words to his face in the congregation of Muslims who could be thousands of them listening. Uh, they would even, uh, in some reports, uh, uh, disrupt uh, uh, Imam Ali when he's leading the prayers. They would disrupt the prayers itself by saying different things during the prayer or moving about or trying to, to do whatever they could to annul um, his, his position as uh, the, leader in, uh, the leader of the Muslims. Uh, so if, if we can understand this, it's very important to understand because uh, you know, this is not a historical thing. We are obviously looking at history, and we are trying to take into consideration the different aspects of, these, of this uh, written history. Uh, but also, some of this can very easily be applied to today's world. Uh, when, when there is a leader, or there's an Islamic movement, or there's an Islamic state, and it's on its course, and then there's those who disagree with a very sensitive decision that was made by the Islamic leadership, and how the internal Muslim psychology can turn against its own self. Because this is what happened here. Uh, a part of an, the internal Islamic psychology began to turn on its own self. But if we don't read and understand and analyze and thoroughly dissect this history, then how are we going to understand what we're going to do today? Um, another way of, uh, of giving a definition to the Khawarij was that they uh, pronounce the word of kufr on al Imam Ali, and uh, they also um, followed that by the bara'a from Imam Ali. You know what the bara'a is? It's a disavowal, uh, meaning we have nothing to do with you. You're not our leader, and we are not the people who you are leading. We we just disassociate ourselves from you in every sense of the word and then um, that grew into a position that was similarly applied to Uthman to Talha and to Zubair and then to all the rulers of Bani Umayyah because this is the time when they were active when Banu al-Abbas the Abbasis or those who came after the Umawis. When they were around the, the Khawarij, these types of people had lost their drive. They lost momentum. Uh, it was a long struggle. And from their perspective, it was a long struggle. And the struggle took its toll on their numbers. So they began to decrease and decrease until when the um it's almost like when the Umawis um, when the Umawis were out of the seat of power and Khawarij were out of uh, the active uh, and some may say violent opposition that they uh, they faced the Umawis with um, and in the meantime even though they were very um, they would, I, I think they would like to say they were revolutionary. Uh, but that didn't mean that they didn't have communication with those who are ruling. Um, they came to Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was considered um, the, mo the, the, 
the, the best ruler of the Umayyads who displayed uh, justice. If we compare him with all the rest of the Umayyads, and this is a matter of comparison, he comes out looking way better than all the rest. So there was an occasion where these Khawarij went. He said, I, I want to speak to you. Let's see what's going on. Let's, let's try to come to some type of agreement. So the, in, the, in the discussion that, w- that went back and forth between Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and the Khawarij, they asked him that you have to disavow yourselves from all your predecessors, all the Umawis who ruled before you. You have to disavow yourself uh, from them. He said, well, I, 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 I disagreed with much of what they did. I rescinded much of what they did. I'm, I'm concerned with justice. And this thing about disavowing and all of this, I'm not going to get involved in that. They said, then, you, you know, you're just like them. You're another Kafir, more or less. For those of you who are familiar with the French Revolution, uh, the French Revolution had uh, three buzzwords. Uh, fraternity, free, well, freedom, fraternity, and egalitarianism. Um, uh, another way of saying it is liberty, brotherhood, and equality. These uh, Khawarij had also three sort of buzzwords in their context. The first one was Al-Iman. We're familiar with what Al-Iman is. And then the other one was the, the expression that I mentioned, لا حكم إلا لله. And the third one was التبرؤ من الظالمين, which means uh, disavowal of all unjust rulers or all oppressors. And um, in the course of the French Revolution, I'm just saying this as a parallel, if, if you have a sense of what was going on in the French Revolution, there were those who were called Jacobins. They were like the, um, the hot heads who took these words uh, of freedom and fraternity and egalitarianism. They took them to the extreme and they began killing left and right everyone who disagreed with them. And the, almost the same thing uh, it was applicable to the Khawarij. They took these three words, Al-Iman, La Hukma illa, bil, illa Lillah, and at tabarruq Min al they took them very literally. And whoever didn't fit their own definition of what these words meant, and by the way, they would go only by surface, uh, the surface meanings of the words. They had, no, um, they had no depth of understanding, so to speak. And so whoever didn't fit in that mold, they could easily target him and shed his blood. It was a very, it was a very uh, simple thing for them to do. They had no second thoughts, no qualms. They did the right thing, and they just move on. To try to be um, as objective as we can about this, in, in reading about them and looking at them, uh, we find out that they were uh, a, a type of uh, people who uh, were impulsive about um, sacrificing what they had. You know, an average person would say, well, let me think this through. And they had nothing about thinking something through. If it had to be done, they're going to do it. And if, if in doing it there's going to be sacrifices, then let there be sacrifices. Uh, they displayed a, almost an obsession with death. They wanted to die. And when it came to taking risks and danger, uh, they would take risks and dangers. If something, if someone said, well, that's risky, that's dangerous, and instead of it, it, uh, taking a little away from you doing it, 
to them it had the opposite effect. It would fuel them doing it. If something is, it's just like in today's, you know, people who take risk, they like to go up, you know, dangerous cliffs and down uh, uh, perilous slopes and, you know, you could die in that, you get, a, you get an adrenal rush out of this stuff. It's almost like that. When you read about them, it's like they get an adrenal rush out of, if it's going to be risky for me to attack a certain, let's say, governor, because there's a lot of guards, that was more incentive for the person attacking, and it wasn't going to obstruct him from doing that. It was something like a psychosis. Uh, I don't know if this brings to, to your mind some of the things that are happening in today's world. Uh, you can see some of these behaviors and uh, these types of characters around. Uh, this also uh, is reminiscent of some of the uh, Christians in um, Al-Andalus. When the Muslims were ruling in Iberia, uh, today's Spain and Portugal, uh, there were some Christians who were so um, almost death-driven to, uh, to prove their loyalty of faith, to prove uh, their dedication to Christianity, that they would at one time, uh, there was a, 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 like a social trend among the Christians of Al-Andalus uh, to use bad language concerning the Prophet. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Um, they would insult him. They would curse him. They would say uh, the combination of the worst words you can conjure, knowing that the penalty for that was to be executed. The Muslim courts around would, as a matter of laws on the book, an insult to the Prophet is equivalent to the death sentence. So there were these types of Christians who would uh, not matter to them. Okay, if it's a death sentence, we don't care. We want to prove our faith. So they would insult the Prophet. I mean, some of them were executed, but it was, it was to the extent where, it, I mean, this is what some history books will tell you. They would go in front of the judge, and in order for the judge to issue uh, an execution order, a death penalty, he would have to hear the person insult the Prophet in such a demeaning and damning way. So the judge would literally put his fingers in his ears. He didn't want to hear it because he didn't want to pass the death penalty on such a person who may be insane. So uh, if we take that analogy and apply it to the Khawarij, they displayed some of that character. They wanted to prove themselves loyal to the way they think. And uh, if that means automatic death, well, it's no problem. One of the uh, characteristics they had at one time was that they would uh, try to take on Muslim public opinion. Muslim public opinion at that time, especially the area that they were uh, living in, uh, was um, very sympathetic to Imam Ali. So in order for them to challenge this Muslim, Muslim public opinion, they begin to curse an Imam Ali in front of the Muslim public, maybe thinking by doing that, that they would, um, uh, that they would um, break or they would somehow destroy this Muslim public opinion that is supportive of an Imam Ali. And then they took that further. Whenever they see that there are other Muslims in other areas, if they stepped outside of Iraq, and there's other areas that they would show some sympathies to Uthman, they would do the same thing. And then they would go further by saying that uh, people who believe in the, um, in the, uh, the goodness of an Imam Ali or Uthman uh, are mushriks. 
And here, once again, we see a very um, uh, unreasonable and um, almost contrived attitude that uh, just drops the word kufr and shirk on anyone that disagrees with them. Um, one of the instances uh, that I, I think dem should demonstrate for you uh, what exemplifies them is that one day they came across Abdullah uh, Ibn Khabbab Ibn Al-Arat one of the uh, the sons of uh, a major personality that was close to the Prophet and uh, this person was with his wife and um, his wife was pregnant so they begin to query this person they begin to ask him questions. What do you think about Abu Bakr? And the guy spoke his conscience, saying basically nothing wrong with him. And he said, what do you think about Omar? He said also basically good things about him. And then they said, what do you think about the first six years of Uthman? So basically you're all right. So what do you think about Imam Ali before the tahkim? He said, he's all right. Then they said, what do you think about Uthman in his last six years? He said, oh, he's all right. Now I'm, I'm giving you just the gist of, of what's going back and forth between the two sides. And then he's, they asked him, what do you think about Imam Ali after the arbitration, after the tahkim? And he once again said, you know, I, I find no fault with Imam Ali, basically. I said, okay, uh, you say such a thing. They dragged him to, there was a river nearby. They dragged him to the river, on the side of the river, and then they slaughtered him. And uh, if you think, I mean, anyone in his right mind would think, First of all, that's going yeah, way beyond anything one Muslim should do to another Muslim. But then they didn't spare his wife, who was pregnant. They, um, they killed her, and then they, um, uh, her, her abdomen area where the fetus is, they, um, uh, they, they lunged their swords into it and brought out the, the, the dead fetus. Um, and it just happened that within that time and place context, they, they moved a little, they came, they came to a Christian. And then uh, the Christian, having known what happened just right there and then, uh, I said, what do you want? He was scared, obviously. He said, what do you want? He said, well, we want the, uh, the, the dates that are on your palm tree here. So he said, you can have the whole tree. He said, no. He said, uh, uh, what do you mean we can have the whole tree? Then they asked him, what are you? He said, I'm a Christian. He said, well, you are in the dhimma of Allah and his prophet. I mean, they're saying like, you're ahl dhimma. All of you are familiar with that word. So they insisted, we were going to take, you know, the, the ripened uh, dates from that tree. Tell us how much it is, because we insist on paying you. And, yeah, well, he wasn't going to argue with them. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's going to be, take him and do whatever you want. These are weird people. They kill an innocent Muslim and his wife just right here. And then here, I, I give all this respect because, I, I mean, it's, and it reminds you of some of today's Muslims, the way they treat other Muslims and the way they consider, quote, unquote, ahl al with, with all the differences that, that move in the opposite direction. Because today's, these types of Muslims today, they give this Ahl Dhimma status to imperialists and Zionists. And then Muslim, I mean, uh, 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 these
Christians, Christians who are, you know, the average person who has a date palm tree or is struggling in his field, uh, they're not very much concerned with his ahad of himma status and all this. Uh, and, and uh, by the way, and this led to what? If, if you can recall some of your Islamic history, uh, th this news, because this was in the southern Iraqi area, southern Iraq today, um, this news reached the Imam Ali, and he said, you know, uh, we'll go to them and they tell them that they have to make up. There's a dia here. There's, you know, questions that have to be answered. There's so he went to them, basically, or he sent someone to go and ask them, uh, who are the killers? Obviously, not everyone killed this person. It may have been 30 or 40 people, but there's two or three individuals who actually did this, uh, this un uh, unconscionable act. And then what they said to him, listen to this, they said, we are all his killers. They're killers, meaning Ibn Arat, his wife, and the fetus. We all killed them. So when they displayed that attitude, then they had to be uh, they had to be taken on, and this is what uh, led to the Battle of An Nahrawan, where about three thousand of them, of these Khawarij, were killed. Of course, to them this was a uh, a, a very serious indication that this went to reinforce their. Um, false ideas that an Imam Ali is a kafir because look now he's killing Muslims he's killing us of all people and they're supposed to have been you know in their own eyes the cream of the crop of the Muslims so um, now in all of this uh, trying to read and understand and be as non-involved emotionally because some people they really get involved emotionally this is it, it, we're going through all of this is like an emotional trap. But if you set aside emotions and you take a very hard look at these khawarij, uh, their character, their uh, motivations, uh, they, they actually believe they were, whatever they were doing, they were doing it with sincerity. This is an irony of all of this. But they actually think that they were sincere in every bloody thing that they did. Now, when you say sincerity, it doesn't mean that that sincerity could not be uh, contaminated with, you know, oh, it's going to serve our purpose, or it's going to enhance our status, or it's going to uh, uh, take away power from those who don't deserve it. And give. So, you know, this sincerity can be polluted, but nevertheless... You sense in them that there is uh, a streak of sincerity. Uh, so we, we begin uh, to uh, sense and visualize in these khawarij, there's a dichotomy, it's like there's a conflict right built into them on, on one hand you find that they display an air of uh, taqwa of Allah obviously uh, th this, is a, this is a very good demonstration of taqwa because they don't consider any power in this world count. nothing counts death is no obstacle public opinion doesn't count the only power they are answering to is Allah so that's a good demonstration of taqwa. And then this sincerity that goes along with it, as I said, it could be polluted by other elements. But at the same time, they have this deviation concerning other Muslims. I, we're going to come to this uh, a little later. Uh, but there was a deviation in them. And there was also a, uh, a type of what today is called extremism or fanaticism. You also sense that they had these types of elements in them. Because, you see, when they encountered other Muslims, and this should serve as a lesson to many of us, when you encounter another Muslim, you want to understand the other Muslim. When they encountered other Muslims, they didn't want to understand the other Muslim. 
they wanted to uh, enforce their opinion on the other Muslim. As if we never learned this lesson, when we come to another Muslim, let me understand you. We are locked into our individuality. And I don't mean individuality as persons, individuality as group identity. We're locked into it. It's the same way they were locked into it. They don't want to hear what another Muslim has on his mind or how he thought about things. They wanted to uh, know uh, what his opinion is about certain things, but not to interact, to either kill or absorb. There's nothing. There's nothing else. You're either one of us, so you come into our way of things, or you're not one of us, and we're going to kill you. I mean, with Muslims rich in this history, you should learn from it. And not right now, going through it all over again. Uh, if we, uh, no, no, at the beginning, when we want to take a look at now, who are these khawarij as far as uh, society is concerned? Did they come from cities? Were they urban people? Or were they nomadic? Basically living in the isolation areas of the desert. And it's the latter. The way the khawarij began were, they were these nomads who um, who never had a sense of developed life or um, uh, the, the cultured or civilized aspects of life. Um, their lifestyle and their um, their, their, if we can call it social ambience, um, was characterized by extreme poverty. Of course, this lends itself to some people who really like to look at history through class contradictions. But uh, this has nothing to do with class contradiction as much as it has to do with um, the the primitive way of living giving itself or uh, inducing um, mass bouts of self-righteousness as, as we come across here with these khawarij. Uh, they also, it seems like, I'm, I'm trying to be as as sensitive to this issue as possible without taking any sides. Of course, I'm not a Khariji or anything like that. But it seems like uh, if you trace the, person the main personalities of this um, political trend within Islam, uh, if you trace them as far as their families and their grandparents were concerned, um, they were living in poverty before Islam came, and they still lived in poverty after Islam came. Um, whether this social dynamic had any effect on, um, on them, I, I, I'm going to leave that as an open question. Another, uh, another element that works itself into this is the Arabian Peninsula uh, had two strains of um, two strains of uh, of clan dissension or tribal dissension. One of them is called Mudar. The other one is called Rabia. And Quraysh uh, in Mecca. Uh, was an extract of Mubar. And these Bedouins, who are later on uh, the uh, mainstay of the Khawarij, 
they were from Rabia. So did this have? Uh, no, we're, we're speaking about the Muslims now, but this pre-Islamic condition could it have had a type of internal uh, uh, influence on them later on? Because later on we're going to see how they didn't consider Quraysh or. Uh, uh, Mecca or Medina or tribes or language groups, none of this figures into who's going to lead the Muslims. You know, there's a hadith that the other Muslims share, they say, Al-Immatu min Quraysh, the Imams come from Quraysh. They say, no, 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 we don't have, this is not a hadith sahih, there's nothing uh, valid about this hadith. So, what I'm trying to say, could that, being that they, if they look at the origins of the tribal system in Arabia, being that they are from Rabia and Quraysh is from Mudar, could it have factored in to their um, uh, to their uh, if I want to use the word idealistic some people take issue with it and if I'm going to use the word utopian some people take issue with it. But the, 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 the fact of uh, the matter is that when it comes to leading the Muslims, they dropped all worldly considerations. Whoever qualifies may lead. And that is if, if a leader is necessary, because we're going to come and see, some of them are going to tell us, an imam is not necessary. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. Okay, now, these khawarij, just like you have Sunnis, so-called, and within that Sunni atmosphere you have schools of thought or different trends, the same way you have Shi'is, so-called, and then within that you also have schools of thought and different strands, the same thing here when you come to al khawarij When we say khawarij they were not all of one mindset. They even had differences among them. Uh, we're going to take a, a quick view at these differences among them. The first, uh, the first, let's let's call. I, I, I don't I don't like to use the word, but uh, some people do use that. Uh, let's say the f first sect of al Khawarij uh, is called Al Yazidiyah. Al Yazidiyah has nothing to do with Yazid, the brother of Muawiyah, the son of Abu Sufyan. It has nothing to do, or the uh, Yazid, the son of Muawiyah, the son of Abu Sufyan. It has nothing to do with him. This is a guy's name is Yazid ibn Abi Anisa. Uh, now, one of the particular things that stood this person and his followers apart from the other Khawarij is, he said that Allah is going to send another prophet who will cancel the Muhammadi Sharia, and this other prophet is going to be from the non-Arabs. Of course, he's going to receive scripture, he's going to have a holy book of his own, and then he's, all of this thing about the Qur'an and the Prophet Muhammad is going to be, just like previous prophets, it's going to be um, uh, overturned. Another uh, strain of these khawarij is called Al-Maymuniyah. And this is... Um, this... Uh, uh, strand of their internal fiqhi or uh, political makeup uh, comes from Maymun al Ajradi. That's the initiator of this strand. Now, what's. See, this is what makes it easy because no, no one here is a Khariji. So if we come and say, let's look at some of the uh, weird things that 
we all Muslims don't agree to. And it turns out that they, this particular strand within them, um, they said it is halal, permissible, uh, to marry the grandchildren. Banat al And they also said it's also halal to marry the the grand children on both sides on the let's say there's a grandfather and he has a sister and he has a brother the grandchildren of the sister and the brother are permissible in marriage of course to us this sounds weird but it's a fact of our initial beginnings you can say these are not Muslims okay now let's look at these are some of the you know outlandish and outrageous uh, features within the Khawarij. Now when we say this, that doesn't mean all the Khawarij are like this. It just means a small uh, number of, right now, a no longer existing sect that held to these opinions at one time. Now they're gone. But what, what is it do they, or that they all have in common? Now, what we said here, uh, pertaining to a prophet that's going to come with a holy book and then uh, supersede the prophet Muhammad and the Qur'an, and this issue about marriage, this wasn't shared by all the Khawarij, it was just shared by these two sects, and these two sweat, sects, have dwindled away, have ceased to exist. But what were the principles that brought all of these khawarij together? This is, I think, an important area to consider. They said that the khalifa or imam has to be decided by free, by what we call today, this is almost exactly what they what they believed at that time, and these are the words that are used today in the political lingo. By free, fair, and transparent elections. Yeah. Elections in which all the Muslims participate not in which a particular group of Muslims participate or a particular um, class or elites of Muslims decide. You know what that's in reference to. It has to be done by every single participant Muslim everywhere and anywhere. And once that is done, we have a legal and we have a functional leader. And he continues to in that position as long as he's just. And as long as he is responsible for Islamic laws and their application. But, if he swerves away or violates the position that he is in, then it becomes mandatory upon the same Muslim body that elected him to either relieve him from his responsibilities or to kill him. And then they said there is no um, there's no family, no tribe, and no bloodline 
that has access to this position in disregard to the others. Do you know what that means? That means they don't consider anything that is in reference to Quraysh or anything that's in reference to the Arabs as being a qualifier for leadership. It doesn't matter. Some of them even went to the extent of saying that it's even more preferable that the leader, the Imam or Khalifa of the Muslims is not from Quraysh. And their reasoning of this is because if he's not from Quraysh and he has something wrong, it's easier to get rid of him or to kill him. But if he's going to be from Quraysh, it's going to be a problem. What if he does something wrong and we have to relieve him of his position? It's going to become a big struggle to do that. Of course, that's in case that this particular leader begins to violate the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And they were not just saying this uh, as a pie-in-the-sky idea. They practiced what they said. Their first leader, his name was Al-Rasibi, Abdullah ibn Wahab Al-Rasibi. He wasn't a Qurayshi. He said, you're our leader. So they put their actions where their mouths were. They practiced what they said. Now we come to a particular strain of Al-Khawarij called Al-Najdat. These were the ones who said the Muslims don't need an Imam or a Khalifa. I don't know how many of you have taken uh, political science courses, but there happens to be on the extreme right and on the extreme left of political science ideas nowadays, the notion that uh, we can uh, we can live a civil life without a government. One of one of the persons who's running for president here in the United States actually wants to do away with a lot of the government. He, he, he from the right, he's moving in that direction. Karl Marx is known to have said. Uh, the state will eventually wither away. Now, I'm not saying that these Khawarij belong to the right or the left. What I'm trying to say is, what they said at that time is not something new for us who are living today. You see a lot of ideologues, political theorists, um, uh, strategizing for the future in which... It's not necessary. If we have a strong sense of community, then we can take care of our own issues without having this structure of government upon which we have an ultimate leader, a president or a king or, in this case, in this case, a khalifa or an imam. Who said we need them? And this is what they're saying. But they say, obviously, we don't need an imam or a khalifa if people themselves are able to do justice to themselves. The community type of cohesion that makes it possible for people to go on their everyday life in an equitable and in a fair way. So what's all that about? That's what they say. Uh, But then they go on to say, but... Life being what it is, sometimes that's not possible. And so, therefore, in in these types of times, an imam is is required. So they say, Al-imama ja'iza wa laysat wajiba. So 
you can understand if someone tells you or if someone tries to play on your political knowledge okay we've been through that we've been there and we've done it so to speak and then when it become when the imama becomes wajiba it is because of the maslaha it is because of the muslim interest that makes it wajiba one of the uh, main definers of al khawarij is that they say anyone who commits a dhanb familiar with that word dhanb it's translated as sin sometimes and sometimes it's translated as uh, a crime of sorts so anyone who commits a dhanb according to them is a kafir and they didn't distinguish between one of these if you want to call them sins and the other meaning if you if your sin was that you um that you broke with the muslim government or the muslim imam that you have whichever one that happens to be that is equivalent to saying uh, a lie let's or a fib uh, to your friend both of them are equal there's no they don't discriminate between one then and the other and for that reason they said al imam ali is a kafir because he accepted a tahkim this arbitration that to them was a sin whatever magnitude you may allocate to it was it serious was it less than serious was it an ijtihad was it his opinion or other the the muslim public's opinion that was imposed on him all of this to them didn't factor in and when you realize if you're speaking about basically nomadic people who may not even have the capacity to factor these things in you begin to understand well yeah that's that's their amount of thinking power they can't distinguish because uh, i mean it's that there's sawair and there's kabair uh, there's a lot of things that to them just didn't factor in so even if they considered an ijtihad because an ijtihad is in the final analysis is the best opinion and the best judgment of a person which may turn out in the development of time to be correct or less than correct only time will tell but to them they didn't want to wait for time to tell they they were quick to say even an ijtihad can become a dhan for which a person is a kafir an ijtihad may be equivalent to a sin which renders a person a kafir we're dealing with some very with some very serious um extremists as i said i don't like to use the word uh, especially because it's used nowadays in a war against the muslims but i don't know come up with another word uh, irrational uh outlandish, outlandish uh, illogical uh, they, they 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 they're like a magnet that attracts all these meanings at once uh and so they said the imam ali is kafir and talha is kafir as zubair is kafir it's very interesting i didn't come across any literature pertaining to aisha umm al-mu'minin from the khawarij point of view 
they speak profusely against Al Imam Ali, against Uthman in his uh, last six years of life, against Talha, against the Zubayr, against Muawiyah, against Amr ibn Aas, against. You speak a lot. When it comes to Aisha, I just couldn't come across any anything as far as they are concerned and how they look at, uh, looked at her, perceived her. Okay, now uh, a quick, uh, a quick um, scan of the different sects of Al Khawarij. The first one is called Al Azariqa. Uh, and they, these are the followers of a person by the name of Nafa' ibn Al Azraq. So his last name was Al Azraq. So people who followed him were called Al Azariqa. They were at one time uh, the most significant uh, group within Al Khawarij. They had most of the numbers and they had most of the power. Now, what did they? What, what is, uh, how can we capsulize their ideas? First of all, they said all of their opponents, all of the opponents of Al Azariqa, are mushriks. And they dwell in the fire forever. And it is permissible to fight them. The Azariqa are saying it's permissible to fight their opponents and to kill their opponents. And if you need a reminder here, uh, I don't know of any fight or any war that the Khawarij were involved with against non-Muslims. So when they say their opponents, they mean by that their Muslim opponents. So fighting Muslim opponents and killing Muslim opponents is 100% kosher. They considered, you know, in, in, in the fiqh, the books of fiqh, we have Dar Harb and we have Dar Islam. The abode of war, or the hemisphere of war, and the hemisphere of Islam. In, in the fiqh, or in the um, perception of al Azariqa, the regions or the territories of their opponents is considered Dar Harb. So here we have, with the broader view of all the rest of the Muslims, a Dar Islam that includes all Islamic territories. But here we have, in the perspective of the Khawarij, a Dar Harb within Dar al-Islam. And within this Dar Harb, the same rules apply to the other Dar Harb that the Muslims um, in their fiqh uh, outlined non-Islamic territories, an area of war in which the laws of war apply, in which the concept of prisoners of war apply. So they applied all of this within Islamic territory. You can fight other Muslims, you can take them as prisoners of war, you can uh, consider their women folk to be um, uh, captives of war, etc. And then they said, and then this is an interesting thing here, I mean, they said that the children of their opponents, meaning their Muslim, the Muslims they disagreed with, if, if their children, the children of these Muslim opponents, are to uh, perpetuate in the fire. مُخَلَّدُونَ فِي النَّارِ These are children. So, in a sense, they said the kufr, because right now they're looking at other Muslims as Kafirs. So they're saying, the kufr of my enemy, who's a Muslim, extends to the children of my enemy. So, it's like kufr by association. These are still children, but they 
are nevertheless, because they are children of kafirs, they themselves are kafirs. An interesting thing in their fiqh that you can dig up is they never agreed with the penalty of rajim. You know what a rajim is? A rajim is um, the stoning to death of a married Muslim or Muslimah if they commit adultery. Uh, you find in this particular uh, school of thought, uh, they said, no, we don't agree with that. Because they said it's not in the Qur'an, and to them it was never established in the sunnah of the Prophet. Then, are you full of surprises or you, you want more? <laughs> more. <laughs> yes, more. <laughs> See, this is what makes this a little simpler than the, the, the previous lesson and the coming one. Uh, is because we don't have a, a khariji among us. We do, we would be, you know, walking on shells. You know. They said the prophets. The prophets are subjected to committing kaba'ir and sagha'ir. You know what kaba'ir, major sins, and sagha'ir are the minor ones. They said prophets are, are subject to that just like everyone else. And they quote the ayah in the Quran, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina liyaghfira laka Allahu ma taqaddama min thambika wa ma taakhar. For those of you who... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they take this uh, ayah and they say, the ayah means, uh, verily, we have... Uh, we have or we will cause for you, O Prophet, a breakthrough, uh, an evident breakthrough, so that Allah will uh, pardon your preceding then uh, 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 and the then that is to follow. So they said, okay, so the Prophet has preceding uh, thanb, and he has thanb to follow, even though Allah uh, pardoned him of, of these dhunub, preceding ones and following ones. But the ayah tells you that the Prophet has committed preceding and following dhunub. So these are the azariqa. These are, as we said at the beginning, the most significant, the most important, the most numerous, and the most powerful of the khawarij. These were some of their uh, salient, uh, distinguishing uh, ideas. Then they are followed by another group of khawarij called al-Najdat. First it was al-Azariqa, and now it's al-Najdat. These are the followers of Najda ibn Uwaymir. And more or less they were like an Azariqa, except for the following. They did, not, they did not pronounce the judgment of Kufr on Khawarij who refused to go out and fight. Which means what? Which means an Azariqa used to consider even their own Khawarij who would not carry arms and go out and fight as being Kafir. So when we come to a Najdat, uh, a less, let's say, um, a less violent prone ideological set of thinking, they said, no, if, if someone stays behind, doesn't go to the war, doesn't mean he's a Kafir. Like you, in, you Azariqa are saying, he's not a kafir. We don't say he's a kafir. Okay. 
And we don't think that killing children is halal. Because Al-Azariqa said that if we're going out to do war against our Muslim opponents and we kill them, we can also kill their children. But these Najdats said, no, we can kill our opponents, but we cannot kill their children. And then they, uh, they disagreed with, um, with the judgment or the evaluation of Ahl al-Dhimma, basically Jews and Christians, who were living with Muslims. The Azariqa said that their lives and their families are sacrosanct, inviolable. Their, their blood is haram. These are the ones who are saying you can kill Muslim children, but you cannot kill Ahl al who are living with the Muslim kafirs that you are killing. But these Najdat were in the, in the other matters a little more open-minded came and said, no, you can kill them because they are part of the enemy territory and the enemy population that we are fighting. And we said there's a, a strain of Khawarij that says that the Imam is not wajib. These are the Najdat, the same ones that we're taking a look uh, at right here. Uh, and the, the Najdat also went to a very serious um, implementation of the Mabda of Taqiyya. Meaning, uh, if they were in the presence of other opponent Muslims who they considered kafirs, and they estimated that the climate if they were to express their minds and their thoughts on certain matters, would turn against them, then they would pretend uh, to be part of the larger Muslim body around them. They, in other words, they'd, they'd conceal their true identity. Uh, unlike other Khawarij, who uh, thought that was a maybe a form of uh, hypocrisy or... Um, insincerity or whatever. These Najdad found there's nothing wrong with that at all. And let me say that in the year uh, 66 of the Hijrah, these Najdad were in control of the following areas, Bahrain, Hadramaut, Al-Yemen, and At-Ta'if. Al-Bahrain, Hadramaut, Al-Yaman, Al-Ta'if. And then we come to um, another strain of Al-Khawarij called Al-Ibadiyya. That's the, more or less, the Khawarij that we have, well, they, uh, to be honest, uh, I've had encounters with them, with al ibadiyya and they feel somewhat offended if a person uses the word khawarij to refer to them. So if you ever encounter uh, Muslims who come from this general background, and right now we're speaking about uh, maybe 99% of them who are ibadah, they, they will feel um, offended and sometimes um, they will maybe snap back if you try to use the word khawarij uh, to them in referring to them or in speaking about them. Uh, but these ibadiyya, they are the followers of Abdullah ibn Ibad. And they are considered to be the most balanced of, the, of these groups of people that we're talking about. Uh, they don't display any um, 
any of the extremism or irrational behavior uh, or recklessness that is displayed by others uh, who belong to this trend. They never say, the Ibala never say that those who disagree with, those Muslims who, are, who disagree with them are mushriks. They never say that. But on the other hand, they don't say that the Muslims who disagree with them are mu'min. So they leave a, a common area. I mean, they say, okay, you're Muslim. We're not going to go to, the, to one extreme saying you're a mushrik, but we're not going to go to another extreme saying you're a mu'min. And if you're going to encounter the word kuffar or kafirin, if they're going to use it pertaining to other Muslims, and they will from time to time use that word, but they don't mean a kafir of aqidah or a kafir of doctrine and belief, they mean a kafir of ni'mah. So the, the, uh, here's where we encounter... Uh, people who are beginning to think, not superficial and not uh, impulsive, but they're thinking now. Because there's kufr ni'ma and there's kufr iman. So they don't say of any other Muslim, you are a kafir in the iman that we find coming to us from Allah and His Prophet, but you may be a kafir of ni'ma. And a kafir of ni'ma is not due a penalty as is due to a kafir of iman or atiqad. So they say other Muslims are not kafirs in Allah, but kafir, and these are their words, kafiruna fi jandillah, which meaning, which means that they uh, they may deny some of the responsibilities that Allah has put forward, but they don't deny Allah. So they are not this uh, punishable uh, concept of kufr. They, they are not held to this punishable concept of kufr. The Ibadah say that the lives and the blood of those who disagree with them, those Muslims who disagree with them, is sacrosanct, contrary to the others. The others say, no, you can spill the blood of, of those who disagree with you. The Ibadah say you cannot do that. And they say, the Ibadah say that the territory of Muslims is Dar al-Islam, it's not Dar Harb. So they have very real and very deep difference with their uh, with the others uh, well I think the uh, well, it, let me put it this way I, I've, I've asked this to them and they said uh, maybe what distinguishes us is that uh, we believe that the rule of Abu Bakr and Omar were fine. We believe that the first six years of Uthman were also all right. The, the, the second six years we had problems with, and then Imam Ali before the Tahkim, he was he was right. After that, we have uh, some criticisms. They don't go to the extremes like the others. They just say we just have some criticisms of of him. Uh, so they have a position there that doesn't agree with quote unquote Shi'is and doesn't agree with quote unquote Sunnis. So they consider that position to distinguish them from the rest. Uh, but I, I'll cover some of this, I think, in, 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 in the following. Uh, now, these ibadah, as well as the other khawarij, they were in, uh, we can't forget this, even though I didn't repeat it as much maybe as I should have, but you can't forget the fact that these were rebels that were in like in a perpetual war with the Umawi state. I mean, their war began with the, um, uh, for those of you who attend the khutbah, you, you know a little more about this, but just as a reminder, uh, they hatched this 
a plot to kill the first three individuals that they thought were the problem now that has beset all the Muslims. They had identified in Mecca when they were going to the Hajj these three individuals to be Al Imam Ali, Muawiyah, and Amr ibn al So we've got to kill these people. So it, that's how it began. But it didn't stop there. What, what happened is after the Imam Ali uh, joined Heavenly Company and uh, after Muawiyah began to uh, engage them in warfare, they engaged Muawiyah in very serious warfare. As I said, these were not, they were not there just making, you know, scoring uh, brownie points or trying, they, by the way, some of them were very eloquent individuals. They used to speak their mind with an eloquence that could capture public attention. And some of these rulers, Umawi rulers, were afraid of, the, of, the, uh, of their public, um, uh, their uh, ability to, to capture public opinion. Uh, so they were in this perpetual war with the Umawis. I don't know, I was getting off on a point. I, I forgot what my point is. Uh, but anyways, let, let me just uh, plant this in your minds that uh, these were in uh, an unending clash with the Umawi state. They, they were not satisfied by saying these Umawi rulers are wrong and they are Kathars, even though you know that's what they said. But in addition to that, they said we're going to fight them. And some of them said, even this was, I think, uh, the common denominator that most of them had. If we are 40 men, then we constitute a fighting force. 40 of them could not get together without fighting. Less than that, they had to say, oh, we don't have the quorum here. We're 38. We're 30, but we're not 40. Once they reached 40, they had to go and fight. There was no excuse. So this is the way they were dealing with uh, the rulers of Bani Umayyah until finally uh, a lot of the, uh, the bleeding of the Umayyah regime came from this type of opposition. So they, uh, in this type of warfare, they said that if we fight these other... Because who are they fighting? They're fighting Muslims. Uh, Muslims, you know, on the wrong political course, but they were fighting Muslims. The other Khawarij said, their peers, let's say, said, from the other, their other schools of thought, if we fight them, then whatever uh, spoils of war uh, they leave behind is ours. But these Ibadah said, no, if we fight these, because these are Muslims, their spoil of war is not ours. We cannot say this is ours, it belongs to them. Except for two things that the Ibadah would gain from their opponents. And that is the means of transportation, if it's a horse, if it's a camel, donkey, whatever it is, that's considered part of the war effort. So if that's a spoil of war, they would claim it. And the other one is the arms. If it's a sword, if it's a spear, if it's a... Uh, a slingshot, whatever it is, whatever they consider to be um, weapons, they'd say, this is ours. We defeated you and this is ours. But if you have territory, if you have uh, estates, if you have a house, whatever you have, that's yours. We're not, uh, unlike the others, say, no, this is, you know, this belongs to us. Uh, the the Ibadah, unlike the others, in this Khawarij context, they, they, uh, they honored the testimony of other Muslims. Qabilu shahadat al-mukhalifin, meaning those Muslims who disagreed, that they still honor their testimony in a court of law, or they will still honor their word. They wouldn't say, just because you are uh, an opponent, and then... You know, just like the others, you're a Kafir, so we don't believe anything you say. And they, they, the Ibada did not, did not go to that extreme. Uh, and they also intermarried, and the Ibada intermarried with other Muslims, and uh, laws of Wiratha were applied equally. They, there was no, unlike the others who thought this, this could not happen. 
And uh, I, I'm going to remind you of a statement that Imam Ali said at the beginning of this um, of this uh, Khariji uh, development in Islam. Uh, knowing uh, that uh, the uh, perpetrator, uh, perpetrator of the crime, uh, the criminal who killed Al Imam Ali, was one of these people. Uh, the, the same, you know, group of people they've been talking about here in the past hour and a half. Knowing that he was one of them, he said he said a statement. I think that is that should be the standard of all Muslims in in looking at these types of people then and now and whenever they they pop up. He says, ليس من طلب الحق ليس من طلب الحق فجانبه كمن طلب الباطل فناله which means you can't equate those who are seeking this haq but have gone in the wrong direction in trying to reach it you can't equate them this is in reference to these types that we're talking about you can't equate them with those who are seeking al-batil and have found the way to get to it and obtained it meaning the Umawis and the others who, who were in this uh, in this fight against him.
Mecca'i. So Imam Ali was uh, somewhat, even though the criminal who killed him uh, came from this background. This is you can you can sense the greatness and the magnitude of Imam Ali when even the he wasn't as personal as to take out the crime that came his way on all the people who are enlisted in in the same ideology or in the same frame of mind as the perpetrating criminal who killed him. He could see the larger picture and he wanted, he sort of um, discouraged Muslims from a, a wholesale assault on these types when there's a larger picture of pursuing the, these people who are intent on al batil and then reaching there, meaning the Umawis. Don't take your... Uh, even in, uh, that, uh, in his moments of expiring and dying, he didn't have his eye uh, uh, away from the main enemy. Something... It's very rare that can happen to uh, even the best of human beings, but... Imam Ali was exceptional. Uh, now, uh, to come to the uh, uh, ending part of, of this uh, description of al-Khawarij, we have some Khawarij who, even though as much as we want to in our own selves, to be inclusive of Muslims as far as we can. But sometimes some Muslims have gone to such an extreme as open-minded as you want to be and as accommodating as you want to be. It's very hard to uh, you know, say that some people who think like this can be comfortably within the Muslim crowd. Uh, such as al Yazidiya. By the way, last time, I, uh, because I, I think uh, I had a little more to say about the Shia and the Shia, uh, one of the areas that I didn't, uh, that didn't cover um, that I wanted to towards the end was the fact that, just like we're seeing here in al Khawarij, uh, that there were some people who had some uh, thoughts that would exclude them from being comfortably uh, defined as Muslims. We also had this happen with the Shia, some of whom, now when we say some, it's a very small number, and that doesn't mean that we can generalize. Just when we look at the weird opinions or ijtihad or um, ideas of al-Khawarij, you come and generalize it, well, all of them are like that. Let's be careful and uh, be accurate. So, in the case of a Shia, there were some Shias who said that an Imam Ali somehow, and here's where you get into murky areas, and this always happens when uh, people want to elevate other human beings almost beyond uh, humanity or beyond humanism. So uh, they, they escalate their ideas uh, to give you the impression that Imam Ali was somehow divine. He was a god in some sense. That, I mean, that's a fact in our history, in, 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 in our uh, uh, century to century, or... Uh, throughout the course of the past 400 years, we had then, and we have even now, some people, minute in number as they are, who somehow, once again, I don't want to get into, they can, get, they can explain themselves, if you ever come across them, you might want to ask them, and, and let me tell you, they are very um, reluctant to answer. But if you find someone who has an open mind and open heart, ask them, what do you mean, you know, Imam Ali is divine, or is God, or something like that. Well, however way they say it, I mean, yeah, come on. He's a human being, just like we're human beings. He's a special human being, but he's not God. 
Yeah, so we, that, that's a problem. We, yeah. And then El Khawarij here also, uh, they said some things that, you know, you just, you can't, you just, you can't fit it. You can't fit it into the Quran, into Allah's book and Allah's Prophet's life. And just like, you know, the, the Yazidi at the beginning, we said, they said that Allah is going to send a prophet from the Ajam and this prophet is going to cancel everything. Not cancel, but he's going to override everything that Muhammad said and brought and he's going to have his own religion, all this stuff. Where did this come from? And then these Maymuniya, the ones that uh, are attributed to the Khariji called Maymun al Ajradi. The ones who said it's permissible to marry the uh, granddaughters and the granddaughters on, you know, from the grand aunts and uh, grand uncles, uh, and saying that the Quran did not mention that. It's true. When you read the Quran, go to Surah Nisa, Hurrimat Alaykum Ummahatukum, you know this ayah about Khalatukum Muhammadu. But it doesn't say the granddaughters of. You know the uh, uh, the the, the, grand, uh, the grand children from from the person's direct line, or the grandchildren from his brother or sister. The Quran really doesn't mention that. So in in the in the superficial sense, if you're taking word by word, they found they found something, and they said this is halal. But you know, if the Quran says the khala and the amma. Then by extension it means their daughters. Come on, wake up. So they couldn't, they couldn't, and all Muslims agree to this being haram. They came out and said, oh, we found something here, and then this is not haram. You didn't find anything. You just could not read within the lines. That's your problem. You just couldn't find, you, 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 you couldn't catch it. You didn't have a problem there. And then when they came to the Quran, they denied that Surah Yusuf is part of the Quran. These Maimuniyah said Surah Yusuf is not part of the Quran. They said it's a love story. And then the other one said, uh, the Surah Yusuf, look, remember, uh, you see, I could have repeated this every other uh, idea that I gave you. These people were always fighting. You can't, you can't forget this fact. They were always fighting, so they come took the Surah Yusuf and said, Yusuf, a prophet, joined the Pharaoh's government? Ah, this can't be part of the Qur'an. So a love story, joining the, and these people are fighting all the time. They're fighting to such an extent that they made Salat al-Qasr and al-Jama'ah, they made it a feature of their life. Because they, they, they always they prayed the four raka'at, two raka'at, even if they were at home. And uh, you ask them, well, how, did, how did you do something like that? Where did you come up with this idea? They said, well, in order for you to pray four raka'at, you'd have to feel that you're at home. And we don't feel at home, even though we are at home, because we're wanted. We're always underground. They want to kill us. So we're always hiding, and we're praying it to raka'at. So it's not like, you know, it, 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 there's no, uh, there's, there's something in there that gives them, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, something to go by in saying what they are saying. But, you know, it's, as I said, it was easier to speak about al Khawad. You see, no one was sort of, I, 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 I sense, a speak, I, someone in my position after many, many years, you can sense when there's tension out there. <laughs> I didn't sense any tension this time. <laughs> Okay, get and embrace yourselves for next time. <laughs> right. I think our two hours are up. I don't know if we have any questions and answers. What do you want to do with the rest of the time?
Well, these people who said Suri Yusuf didn't exist, it's a very... First of all, Khawarij were, uh, uh, were small in numbers as a whole. If we take a look at Al-Azariqa, and we take a look at Al-Najdat, and we take a look at all these schools of thought that they had inside of them, they were small to begin with. And then um, within this small number, there was a group of them, just a small group that said something like, uh, you know, you can marry your granddaughter, or you can, or, or Surat Yusuf didn't exist. So when, if, if I wanted, there's nothing in the books that I came across that will give you numbers, but if I wanted to tell you those uh, who call themselves Khawarij, who thought Surat Yusuf uh, is not part of the Quran, if I would take, take an educated guess, say about 40 or 50, not more than that. And then those who, who said that you can marry, you know, the, the granddaughters and this, probably the same thing. Maybe a hundred, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And that was that. So it's not like we're looking... Community that came up the more or less. Yeah, because they were living community lives also. They didn't have this, uh, uh, except for that, uh, like I mentioned, around the year 66, where this was probably their uh, peak, where they peaked. They had more or less control of Bahrain and Hadramaut and Yemen and the Ta'if. Wow, they peaked then. And then after that, they had nothing. So, and so they didn't really have a society to speak of. It's just, you know, it's just like if you take a look at the Black Panthers, the way they were in the 60s and 70s, and you take a look at uh, a lot of these underground groups, it was similar to that. And from time to time, they would, they would uh, make inroads if they did, and they wanted to increase, increase their numbers. It would be among the, uh, to begin with, among the nomadic tribes in the desert. They, it, it, there, weren't, there weren't any, uh, that, I, that I can tell, uh, there weren't any presence that they had in, in cities. They, they, they simply, even when they disagreed with it, Imam Ali, uh, they would not go back to Al Kufa and uh, Al Basra. They they took themselves out and placed themselves in another area, and they would they would not go inside this larger Islamic uh, urban society. Later on, though, a little change happened, and that is even though to begin with most of them were nomadic nomadic Arabs, uh, but when things developed later on, and they they preach this, um, you know, there's no difference between uh, an Arab and a non-Arab, this thing about Quraysh, that appealed to non-Arabs, Muslims who became Muslims, who, this sounds, this sounds fair, you know, when you say Quraysh is going to be somehow the source of leadership, you sort of are giving uh, certain Muslims a status when we're all supposed to be equal. So that sense of equality appealed later on to non-Arabians who became Muslims. So later on, the Khawarij, as they are called, found, uh, and later on, meaning you know, towards their end, they found more appeal uh, among those who are not from the Arabian Peninsula, as opposed to their beginning. Most of the appeal came from within the nomadic parts of the Arabian Peninsula. In, in, one of these, uh, in one of these discourses on the way this relationship in, between the Khawarij and al Mawali, and Mawali is a word used uh, referring to um, non-Arabs who became Muslims, like Persians, like Egyptians, like Byzantines. These were called Mawali. At one time, uh, a Khariji uh, woman was betrothed to a Mawla, one of these Mawali. And the word that circulated among the Khawarij is, uh, you have disgraced us. Meaning this is a disgrace that you are married. Remember, these are the people who said there's no difference between this and that and the other. But when it came time of marriage, it becomes a disgrace here. So uh, they, they're consistent. They're, they're consistent. So sometimes uh, left something to be desired, but that's part of it. Excuse me. I guess I missed this part at the beginning. Who suggested the tahkim? Yeah, you missed that part. <laughs> the tahkim uh, came up about uh, when the uh, camp 
or the army of Muawiyah was losing. Everyone knew that Muawiyah was losing. Muawiyah's side knew that they were losing. Imam Ali's side knew they were losing. So when that moment came, uh, Muawiyah's second-hand man, or his lieutenant, first lieutenant, uh, Amr ibn al-As said, I got an idea. Why don't we tell our troops to raise the masahif and call for arbitration, at tahkim which they did. And, f- and I was trying to say, that was the genesis of the coming into being of these khawarij that we were speaking about. Okay, and it turns out that the, his supporters outnumbered his who? Ali supporters. His who? This lieutenant. No, 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 no. no. And why did Muhammad accept that? Yeah, Imam Ali accepted because within his own rank and file, the majority accepted the tahkim. Okay, so the majority accepted. That's right. And he accepted. Not that it was his choice. But here is where you have the dynamic of ruling and ruled. And that's why I pose the question. Some people think a ruler is detached from the people he is ruling. I don't share the idea. I think a ruler is responsible to the people that he rules, even though what they want may not be his first choice, but it was theirs. And that's what carried the day. From what I remember, they told that if you don't accept, we're going to kill Hassan and Hussein or something like that. Could have been. Could have been. Sure. Especially from these types. So basically, the first. I think so. Yeah, you can say that. I, I have no difficulty with that. The question is, should he? is he in a position to be forced? So, some people, the way they think about this, they say, no, he's not in a position to be forced. So that's, you know, these areas you have to think about. Let's not, you know, think that we can think it all out in three minutes. Something to think about. Let it penetrate. Give it time. Think about it. And then we can talk about it later on. <laughs> Where's your father, by the way? Oh, he says mom. Oh, let's do this. Thank you. Give him a question. I'm sorry. So you basically divided Muslim groups into Shia, Sunni, and Khawarij based on... No, I didn't divide anyone to anything. How <laughs> <laughs> are you? Um, <laughs> I didn't divide anyone. This is the way. Shias, Sunni, and Khawari. Shias were wrong for being. They didn't accept Khalafa. I didn't use that word, by the way. You're using it. I use it because they started with that. Yeah, well, I, I don't use that word. But anyways, you can go ahead. Go ahead. And as long as you make it clear that you're expressing yourself, you're not expressing what I'm expressing. <laughs> How much is good? Uh, well, uh, okay. Uh, and then Khawarij who accepted part of the Khalafa and, accept, and uh, didn't accept the other part. Or, but first six years of uh, Osman, they accepted it, they said it's right, the next six years they said it's not right. Correct. So it is basically a political. Uh, the thing that divides these three groups is political. Very good. That's the way it's supposed to be. See, if we go back to these defining uh, times, that's exactly what it was. Uh, but in, we, when we come to today, it's not like that. I mean, what, uh, today, before the Muslim, uh, how a Muslim is distinguished from the other Muslim is by some rituals. It's not by these issues. I mean, how do we make our decisions? How do we appoint or select or... Uh, render a leader to be a leader. These issues that should, you know, occupy center stage in our minds are no longer there. We've sort of now uh, settled on. And by the way, during that time, uh, people who used to pray with their heads like this and hang they were all over the place. They were mixed here and there. So you couldn't define a Muslim by the way they were praying. This came about later. When, when uh, the political positions now, after you know this era of time that we're looking at, after the political positions were defined, then the rituals began to fit in. 
then it became uh, classical to identify a Muslim. You look at the way they pray, oh, I know what type of Muslim that is. But that wasn't the, the case at that time. There's difference in ritual of what even at that time, like right after the Prophet passed away? But what, what, what was it considered a difference? It was considered a variety. Now it's considered a difference. Mm -hmm. Two different things. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the, uh, the three slogans or catchphrases they would use. Um, the hukmah uh, and... La hukma illa lillah. Right. And that's about the rule. Well, the first one was... Well, the first one was Al-Iman. Al-Iman. Which some people can say is faith. Uh, but it's commitment to Allah. Al-Iman. La hukma illa lillah. Wa tabarru min al Okay. Um, also, before this, you know, Sifin and this sort of... That was sort of where these Qawaraj were created... Uh, were Muslims calling each other or were leaders or trends of Muslims you know basically pronouncing you know uh, kufr on you know their enemies was that happening before they came into the picture no it wasn't happening uh, the, the only instance that I that I can recall that is um, clear uh, in the history books is when um, the opposition to Uthman climaxed in the climaxing of that opposition there was a there was a, a, a sentence that circulated among his, among Uthman's opponents that said uqtulu na'thalan faqad kafar kill na'thal na'thal is a, a way to, to to describe a person who has degenerated and is irrelevant right now because the men said فَقَدْ كَفَرْ for he has become a kafir but that was just a, 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 among a very few people uh, who right now were agitating to get rid of Uthman when they came to Al-Medina in the final days of Uthman and uh, it wasn't an ideology, it wasn't a school of thought, it wasn't uh, a principled statement. It was, it was something that, it would be interesting to know where, how it originated. I, I couldn't find an origin, but it was there. It was said. That, that, that's, the, that's the first instance that we can trace the usage of the word kafir by mus one Muslim or some Muslims against one Muslim or other Muslims. But it wasn't. We don't have it like it now appears with that, these khawarij. Is that count during, the, um, during Abu Bakr and his uh, uh, Khalifa? Or is that after Abu Bakr? No, no one said they were kafirs. The, these wars were called Hurub al Rinda, uh, which means uh, the wars that um, were dealing with those who are trying to renounce Islam. The, the, yeah, the, these people, what they did said, yeah, we, you know, we're Muslims and everything else, but we don't want to pay our financial dues to the Islamic State. Right. And you, the word that's used among uh, the average Muslim is the wars of, apost uh, of apostasy. But the word apostasy is one of these words that uh, it doesn't carry with it the civic and the social and the political and the ideological component of Islam. It just carries with it a religious or a uh, creed-based uh, concept. But these people, they were more, they, they were not, actually they were not denouncing any creed. They were reaffirming their creed. We are Muslims in every sense of the word. Look, we're fasting, we're going to Hajj, doing everything. The only thing we're not, we don't want to do, we don't want to pay the money that you, say, that you say we should be paying to the Islamic budget. So war was launched against them because uh, this is a, a major component of Islam. And if you begin, the, the Muslims at that time, during the time of Abu Bakr, they understood if you're going to begin here, then you're going to begin to undo Islam fairly quickly and we're, we're going to end up with nothing. 
So there was a war against them. But the, the, the thing about Kufr is saying that they are Kafirs, it never occurred. You see, there was serious war that was going on, but the Khawarij attitude was not present. So it wasn't people saying, oh, these are Kafirs, let's go kill them. This also takes into account the disagreements or the discussions prior to the battles of Jamal and Sufiyah. Yeah, that, that was like, a, yeah, if you, if you want to factor that in, it was like an incubation period. And Jamal uh, was like an incubation period for these types that were appearing later on. But they just didn't surface at that time. Did you know that the ayah about, um, you were talking about Ben, Ben and the holy prophet that they're using as, you know, he even he commits, you know the ayah? That's, that's, I think, the first A in Surah Al-Fatah. It's in Surah Al-Fatah. Just look on the first page, you'll find it. Al-Fatah. Okay. Um, you said that, um, and Medjah said that uh, an imam is a gift and not a requirement, something along those lines. So... Then the rest of the Muslim public believes that Imam is necessary. So what's the implication of that to us living here, sort of this Imamist state? <laughs> well, we have to get. I mean, they, they were speaking at that time when there was an Islamic order uh, that was in progress. Right now, when we speak, there's no Islamic order in progress. So. Uh, they may have had some excuse in saying, look, oh, you know, we have an Islamic uh, society out there. Uh, the only problem we have is with the political system. And one of the solutions to this political system is it just goes away and let the Muslim society... I'm, I'm trying to give you the sense of how a Khawarij would, would respond to you. They, they tell you, uh, if this government just goes away with all the ills that it has in it, just leave the Muslim society, we can, we can do with what we have. Why do we need all of this, you know, polarization about who's going to be leader and how we're going to run this thing and all this? Do away with the whole thing. But, they say, but if, if we do something like that and it appears that, no, no, we're going, to ha- we're going to need a leader, then, yeah, we have to agree to have a leader. And the way they agreed to have a leader was by this free, fair, and transparent election involving all Muslims, excluding none. Man's getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm, I'm going to ask my questions in every class. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have another class, by the way. It's on Mondays, every Monday. It's, it's more, you know, it covers the, the Sira aspect of the Prophet's life, but there's, you know, it's reading the Arabic and translating and understanding words, and we come across ideas and we sort of try to dwell on them and everyone's uh, invited to come it's just basically at your own pace if you want to read a sentence you can read one if you want to read a paragraph you can read one uh, If you, you try to translate what you can whatever you can we help you out with it it's, it's left up to your conscience and your self uh, effort come again which book Oh, the book is, uh, what's the, uh, Sirat al-Nabi by Al-Nadwi. We try to take a book that is simple, and this is uh, simple meaning as far as language is concerned. There's a lot of books on Sirat, but you have to get something that, because of the level, that can fit into the few brothers and sisters we have. So this is what we found. If someone can... We're going to, by the way, end this maybe in about another two or three months, and we're going to be going on to something new, so we're inviting feedback on that matter. Yes, I think. Your questions sometimes are tough. <laughs> Make them move. Simple. Is, uh, is there any literature or any, any reading that you looked at um, that at the time that uh, the Khawarij were emerging? They were only emerging and uh, destabilizing Imam Adi's camp, right? 
hmm. or his uh, his domain. Hmm. Uh, is there any literature that shows that uh, Moravia was somehow egging them on <laughs> to sort of destabilize his enemy's camp so that you know they break apart? It's in Arabic. Yeah. And unfortunately, I can't come across much literature about this whole thing in English. Uh, in particular, the point that you're asking about, there's a, an author by the name of Ibn Abi al-Hadid. He, uh, he wrote a, uh, uh, an explanation of Nahj al balagha He deals with this specific area that you're speaking about, how, how al-Khawarij and how Bani Umayyah were um, were at each other uh, in this ongoing warfare. How, especially how uh, Bani Umayyah tried to uh, re- wreak havoc inside Al Khawarij, uh, sometimes by buying them over. And it gives examples. It'll give you name of names of individuals from among Al Khawarij who could be bought over. Uh, give them 4,000 dirhams a month and things like that. So there is uh, information in, in this particular book. And this particular book is also used uh, by, uh, for those of you who are not aware of what I'm saying, Ibn Abi al-Hadid is quote-unquote a Shi'i. But uh, his, the information that he has in, in this particular book, he also uh, is quoted by uh, Sunni, quote-unquote, scholars. So it, 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 it's uh, 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 what you may call an objective look, because the Khawarij, they really, um, uh, more or less, they're disowned by Sunnis and Shiites together. So if, if a Sunni or Shiite speaks about them, it's like they, they can exchange information and they don't have difficulties with it. Uh, uh, unlike when they deal with each other. But yeah. So, and what's the other question? Yeah. The other question was about, um, you were saying that these uh, Khawarij uh, and the way that they look at the world sort of in a binary way, you know, that you're either a Kafir or you're a Muslim. Uh, that this might have had something to do with the fact that they came from a social ambiance which was not very civil, not very developed, nomadic. You know, they weren't basically city people. They weren't cultured or educated. Um, and um, uh, in the way that the United States is looking at things right now, it would appear that they're very cultured, very educated that they're coming out with the same type of approach, sort of very binary approach, you know, you're either with us or you're against us. Um, uh, so, um, so I was just, and, and then on top of that, you said that some of these people were very eloquent, you know, suggesting that, you know, that uh, some type of culture or civility did agree with them, that this hardened position yeah. Uh, it's just sort of a disconnect. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, it's, yeah, I, I think I know what you're saying, Afi. But the, the thing is, first of all, their eloquence was among their own types. If they were going to, with this eloquence that they had, if they were to go to urban centers, uh, they would almost fall flat because they didn't have. I mean, you can see uh, there's a there's a sort of um, uh, an extensive area in which the concept of kufr um, they try to justify. They take ayat from the Quran. A lot of these ayat in which kufr is kafirun, and many other ayat that have kufr in it, but they have. Um, a mentality of a um, of a, uh, of gee, I don't want to say non-thinking people, but uh, people who are not predisposed to thinking. So if they're speaking to their own, they have a lot of influence. And there was there many of them. That's how they recruited. They recruited from a pool of people who uh, were basically. Um, 
simple. And uh, this is the way it began. Because later on, what will happen with them, with these Khawarij, is that uh, their popularity would gain from the Mawla, from the Mawalis. And these Mawalis were the ones who came from a civilizational background. They came from a cultured background. They were quote unquote the Persians, they were quote unquote the North Africans, they were quote. Uh, see, in Khawarij, where even though they began in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, when you go to the Arabian Peninsula right now, the only uh, area that the Khawarij live in is Oman. And the Omani Khawarij, if we call them that, as I said, they feel very offended if you did, they are all Ibadis. And the other areas where they are located is in North Africa, originally where there's no Arab, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya. There's pockets of them extending in Zanjibar, uh, part of what is today Tanzania. This is where their numbers are located. So from that initial uh, recruitment among their types, the nomads and the Bedouins, they made that transition just before they, uh, they, they disengaged from their active lifestyle, from this opposition and all of this, uh, to the uh, uh, people right now who were, so if you want to use the word cultured, or of a higher culture, or urbane, or modern of those days, uh, they went into that mode. But overall, when you take a look at, uh, I mean, they have, one of the things I didn't cover here, because uh, I think sisters may have a lot to say about this, and is the issue of equality between genders. They, they're probably the only uh, school of thought that has absolutely no difference between a man and a woman. A woman can lead prayers if she qualifies to lead prayers, so what's the point? A woman can be, because the imamah to them is so um, almost insignificant, because they had to fight against the political problems that came from a governmental structure. So, I mean, to them, do away with it. And even if you don't do away with it, if a woman qualifies to lead, let her lead. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Yeah, these are the Khawarij, the same people we're talking about. So, yeah, it got, it's about 10 o'clock. I know, we're getting a little tired. So. Okay, one quick, two questions. Make them quick so I can make my answers quick. Uh, can you use the word imam? Uh, so, uh, what did they mean by imam at the time? Because we have Khalifa, we have this word. You know, I'm talking about the concept of imam. They mean him as Khalifa, as what? To them, it, 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 yeah, to them, imam and Khalifa just simply means leader. They don't get caught up on, uh, you know, giving it a particular uh, philosophy. Or, just a simple leader of Muslims. As I said, these are not very philosophical people. They were more uh, action prone. It would consider the depths of thought. Other Muslims, like, in the current like, media, when they use imamah, this is for my own knowledge. Yeah. What do they mean by imamah? Because we have this imamah in Tashayya, uh-huh. which has a different, like, specific meaning. Mm-hmm. But in general, when they say imam, what does that mean? Because we have imam Muhammad al-Azali, we have imam Jama'at, yeah. we have... Uh, yeah. Well, let me give you an answer, and I hope the answer can, can satisfy your question. Uh, first of all, you have to, you have to um, tune in to who's using the word. Not everyone's going to use it in the same sense. So you have to know who's using this word. Uh, who is he? Is he uh, uh, someone who's speaking from, <laughs> from a scholarly Islamic background or not? Is the person using a linguistic emphasis of the word or an Islamic emphasis of the word? All of these are nuances that would indicate to you uh, what is meant by the usage of the word imam. Uh, and then, uh, on the other hand, the word imam or a'imma 
in the Qur'an itself has a positive and has a negative meaning. It's not always a straightforward positive meaning. قَاتِلُوا أَئِمَّةَ الْكُفْرِ Fight the Imams of Kufr. For some people who automatically think that the word has some halo and some sacredness to it, the Qur'an is going to strike. He says, no, there's Imams of Kufr. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ إِلَى النَّارِ Another ayah says, and out of them we have made Imams that will lead to the fire. So you know, it depends. You, you, you have to uh, open up your mind and see who's, who's, the, who's the source who's using this, and then how far or how close, how involved are they in the Qur'an and Islamic history. That's, that's about as, <laughs> as precise as I can answer you. Thank you. The other thing, how close is the Wahhabism to Hawaii? Or like the way the Taliban moved or... Like the way that Al-Baghdad thinks. Yeah. Looks like there are a lot of similarities. Yeah, there are parallels. But uh, if you come and ask a, a Wahhabi or a Talibani or whatever, if you come and ask them about the Khawarij, I think they would not... Uh, it's one of two things. Either they don't know much about them. Not, because not many Muslims really know about them. Because they, they simply uh, don't belong to them historically. Or, if they do know something about them, they say, well, we have nothing to do with them. Uh, so don't think that uh, the Salafis or the Wahhabis or the Taliban or these types, don't think that they are influenced by uh, what the Khawarij had to say. They, 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 on certain occasions, display similar attitudes and similar impulses but they're not influenced by them. These are two different things. Uh, yeah, it's something historical. Not, even though, as I said, we can see its manifestations around, but it's not a continuity. Yeah, correct. And if there's no more questions, there will be no more answers. <laughs> وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد